Tonight, we're very pleased to welcome again prolific Chicago writer Greg Borzo. Greg is a freelance writer and has been a full-time reporter, editor, and or writer at Modern Railroads Magazine, The Business Word, American Medical Association, Field Museum, University of Chicago, and others. He's the author of several books about Chicago, The Windy City, The Chicago L, Where to Bike Chicago, Chicago Cable Cars, and Ragbri, America's Favorite Bicycle Ride. And every time he comes back, I tell him, here, we're here for you for the next one that comes out, which I'm sure won't be too far from now. Greg is an accomplished public speaker and conducts tours about bicycles, the L, and cable cars for the Chicago History Museum, the Chicago Ki Cycling Club, and others. So tonight, Greg and his special guests, which he's about to introduce, will discuss his latest exciting book titled Chicago's Fabulous Fountains. Please join me in welcoming again Greg Borzo. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we want to thank the Craig and the Chicago Public Library for hosting us here in such a beautiful setting. It's just wonderful uh, to be here. Thank you for the uh, welcome, the intro, and um, the event that you're, that you're hosting. I will be in, uh, introducing uh, my guests uh, uh, a little later, but just to start with, uh, the photographer to, uh, of the book, Julia Thiel. That's a German name. I do my best to pronounce it correctly. And of, and of course, Deborah Shore. And I'll introduce them more thoroughly uh, later, but I'm just delighted that you're both able to be here. Julia flew in from San Francisco to be with us tonight. So how about that? So welcome to the book launch of Chicago's Fabulous Fountains. It's uh, what a relief to be able to say that. It's been three or four years. Uh, in the making, and I'm very happy to uh, celebrate this with you. Let's begin with uh, an old saying. Write what you know. You hear that in high school. Everybody tells writers that, and it's great advice. But I prefer the corollary. Write what you want to know. And for me, it ended up being fountains. I love fountains. I, I think they're very inspiring and, and beautiful. And so I wanted to know more about fountains. I knew very little about them when I got started. And so uh, initially, uh, this book was going to be about the fountains across the country. And, uh, you know, I took the opportunity to travel all over the country, uh, looking at fountains, photographing them, and thinking about how a book might uh, play out. Uh, that was fun, but um, it struck me as a good idea, uh, a book about fountains, because there's just so many uh, gorgeous ones. Here's the, the Thies de Fountain in, in New York City. You might be familiar with it. And uh, this is the uh, Lattice Fountain in, in uh, San Francisco. So everywhere I went, I found a, a very, very uh, attractive and, 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 and beautiful fountains, inspiring fountains. And so off I went on this project. Um, you know, the, I just felt like that was a great idea. And so off I went on the project, uh, touring the country. And so I thought I'd take you along a little bit on a tour uh, across America, looking at just a, a few fountains. And we'll run through it very quickly, and then we'll review them again um, uh, after we're done. Uh, I'm sure you'll recognize some of them. Note the variety of the fountains, the creativity behind them. How they move us, how they inspire us, how they memorialize important events. Okay, so let's review them now. And uh, I have a confession to make. I played a little trick on you. Every other fountain you saw was in Chicago. <laughs> surprise, surprise. When I started on this project, I didn't pay much attention to Chicago. Because right, Chicago's got Buckingham. And then in 04, we got Crown. 
and a few others in a, you know, scattered around town. So what a surprise to, to find out that we have so many beautiful fountains in Chicago. So this is uh, Rockefeller Center in New York City, as you know. This is Christopher Columbus in Little Italy. Bellagio in Vegas. This is the Garth Fountain in the Fourth Presbyterian Church, right across from the Hancock Center. St. Louis, the uh, Union Station. This is the Board of Trade Fountain, Jackson and La, uh, La Salle. Fourth Sight Fountain in Savannah, seen it in lots of movies. This is Crane Girl, one of four fountains that surrounds Buckingham there in Grant Park. This is the Pineapple Fountain in Charleston. And this is Nature's Friends in a, a little pocket park in Lincoln Park. This is the Firefighters Memorial in Kansas City, Missouri, Fountain City, USA, by the way, which makes Chicago the second city of fountains. <laughs> and this is right along the path on the uh, south uh, side uh, of, of, of uh, Burnham Park, I guess it's down in there. Uh, the bike trail, the bike path along the, uh, the lakefront, right at McCormick Place. And this, of course, is the 9-11 Memorial. And this one, any takers? Aon Center, yeah. So uh, guess what happened? This uh, discovery of all these beautiful fountains around Chicago, uh, you might say a funny thing happened on the way to the fountain book. I decided to focus on Chicago, the windy city, the watery city, water, water everywhere, right? Not only in our rivers and in the lake, but also in our, in our fountains. So in fact, when I turned my fountain radar up and when a, a lot of fountain friends helped me to discover fountains around the city, and I did a little research, I've discovered 125 outdoor public fountains in the city of Chicago, not even counting the suburbs, and many of them are extremely interesting. Most of them are very much worth uh, visits and repeat visits. So I think it's high time to shine a, a light on, on these glorious uh, pieces of art, uh, these uh, majestic uh, Statements, many of them have a very important meaning behind them. So Chicago's already known for its world-class uh, museums, but I'll maintain that its fountains are like an outdoor museum, a, a museum without walls, <laughs> without uh, admission fees, uh, without uh, waiting lines, and without parking problems. Uh, you can uh, explore the uh, outdoor uh, museum of fountains uh, the Museum Without Walls, and you'll see that many of the objects on display, uh, part of these fountains, are world-class artistic objects. They normally would be inside of a museum, uh, but you don't have to go through those hoops. Uh, visit the Museum Without Walls. In this case, this is a, a statue modeled on the great uh, horseman over the Palazzo San Marco in Venice. Uh, this was cast in Venice by a very famous uh, artist and floated down the canals of Venice before it was shipped over to Chicago to stand here on this beautiful fountain right at the Metra Station, uh, Congress and Cell. So likewise, Chicago's already known for its architecture, but I'll maintain that its fountains have uh, artistic uh, touches and elements that are, are, are very very striking and monumental. Again, Chicago is known for its skyscrapers. I'm here to say it's got a lot of sky sprayers uh, shooting water up high into the sky. And I'll also end with this thought that, uh, end this section here with the thought that um, Chicago is known for its great performing arts, right? 
But I see a fountain, I think of it as a performer as well. It's singing, it's dancing, and it has a cast that it's using of water and wind, light and shadows, metal and stone. It's a performance, and uh, the water takes an infinite variety of forms, and uh, every time you go, uh, it's different. Just like every time you go to the symphony, it's different. So, um, I'm gonna mention just a couple of remarkable founds in, in, my, in my book, in my uh, view, and, and then we'll hear from, from our uh, other co-contributors to the book. Very quickly, just so you know, uh, it's important, this is our oldest fountain in Chicago, the Drexel Fountain, uh, down on Drexel and 51st. What makes it remarkable besides its age is the fact that the fella up at the top, Francis Drexel, never set foot in Chicago. It's his sons who built this in his honor. And also, he was a draft dodger, uh, ran around the world trying to avoid the draft from his home country. And he's rightfully honored in, in this case, I think, at the, the head of, uh, of uh, Drexel Boulevard. This is a very uh, remarkable fountain, too. It's in Lincoln Park. It's called Storks at Play. The remarkable thing here is that it has no storks. They misnamed the fountain, and they mismade the uh, birds that are floating, uh, winging around in the fountain. They're, they're actually swans. And I got that from an authority at the Field Museum, so you could take that to the bank. Uh, another remarkable fountain is Fountain Girl, one of four fountains still operating, functioning in Chicago that have a direct link to the World's Fair, the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893, which of course so many people are interested in and, and follow. This was the exhibit, well you see it here in its entirety, the exhibit of the Women's Christian Temperance Union at the Fair of 1893. The goal was to get people to drink water instead of beer. Yeah, well, um, and here you see the in entire setup after the fair was moved to a downtown street, which is where you see it set up here. Well, funny thing about that, they, folks probably would have been better off drinking the beer because the way you would drink from this fountain is you would take one of these shared cups and hold it in the stream of water that was coming down, never mind the horses and dogs that are nearby, but people were spreading germs and disease through these shared cups. And it wasn't just the WCTU fountain, but the Illinois Humane Society had uh, fountains all over the city. There were 60 of these fountains all over town, starting in the 1870s. And initially, they all used the shared cup. It wasn't until 1911 that it was, that it was called the Death Cup, and it was actually banned in Illinois. Well, guess what? What's really special, why, the, why I really want to highlight this fountain, is there's two of these still left in Chicago. And they uh, operate, not with shared cups, they operate with bubblers. So here you see uh, the two of them, and they're both right at the intersection of Chicago and Michigan. Millions of people walking by there every day have no idea that these little uh, cast iron fountains are probably 140 years old and have this wonderful heritage to them. So next time you go through that uh, corner, please stop and uh, uh, take a photo or take a sip of water from uh, the, uh, the bubbler, the human side of the, of the setup. Now what's that? No, it's not an old abandoned water tower. It's not a bus shelter. It's at the corner of Roosevelt and Halstead, and I bike past this intersection a uh, hundred times before I got on my fountain frenzy here, and always wondered what this, this thing is. Well, it's a, it's a beautiful fountain. It's called a Sky Space, and it was put in in uh, 06 to enhance the uh, southern campus of University of Illinois Chicago. And what it is is, it's a fountain because there's this curtain of water that falls along the sides where the walls would be. 
but you go inside and you view the sky through this oval opening. The artist James Terrell calls this an observatory without a telescope. Beautiful concept, and you see the sky, the clouds, the heavens, the stars in a different way by looking through uh, this opening. And I think that's pretty, pretty special. You know, the artist put tremendous amount of, of work and thought into it. And here's what it looks like at night. It does light up, and then there's this uh, a companion fountain to it as well. So there's just, there's just so many artists at work, some of them world-class with very well-known reputations uh, doing this kind of uh, artistic uh, fountain work, like the shit fountain. Well, who, did, you put, who, did you put that in here? <laughs> that fountain is made by Jersey Canar, known around the world uh, for his beautiful liturgical, religious work. He makes altars. He makes uh, doors to churches. These are the seats where priests sit uh, at St. Sabinas, uh, down on the south side. He carves wood, he works in bronze, etc. Highly regarded artist established here in Chicago. He makes baptismal fonts and statues of students and the doors to St. African, uh, St. Benedict the African. Uh, he's, he made these doors. So what was he thinking when he made this? <laughs> Says it right there, shit, fountain, sorry. Uh, excuse my, my French, but that's what it is, and he's quite proud of it. The reason he built this fountain was he got tired of his neighbors not picking up after their dogs. <laughs> and so he built this, what he calls a pile of crap, on top of this pedestal, and he put it on his property. Here's a sidewalk, but it's on his private property in front of his home and studio. So, you know, he's got a good sense of humor, and the neighbors have uh, uh, warmed up to it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go on and on. Um, I like to call this his 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 number his number two fountain, because his is number one fountain. A little more appropriate. This is the Black History Fountain on the south side, and it, it consists of eleven of these enormous. Uh, a metallic balls with the names of uh, uh, super achieving uh, African American artists and musicians and and leaders. Um, so you never know what you'll you'll find on a, a trip through uh, Chicago's uh, fountains. More beautiful and more inspiring uh, photos are, you know, I had fun doing that because I've, I've done a few interviews in the past few days and no one on TV or radio would let me talk about the shit fountain, so <laughs> I got away with it tonight. Um, but let's look more to some of the more inspiring and beautiful fountains um, photographed by uh, Julia Thiel, uh, our uh, wonderful photographer. And I have a few words of introduction here. That's okay. All right, Julia's uh, photography featured in the book will surely make you want to go out and discover all of these Chicago fountains. Her photos bring these fountains to life, and I'm so glad that she partnered with me on this book. Uh, Julia has created the trailer as well that you saw earlier, and guess what? She also built my website and helped me find new fountains, promoted the book and the fountain on social media. Uh, what didn't she do? She created the map, which uh, we're giving out for free. I uh, want all of you to take uh, a fistful of these home tonight, give them to your friends, uh, Julia's work there. And um, in short, she's been wonderful to work with, and so take it away. Well, the pleasure. <laughs> The pleasure, of course, was all mine. I talked him into letting, taking, like, letting me take these pictures. <laughs> um, yeah, and I would like to tell you a little bit more about the adventure I've had taking these pictures and the challenges I faced while tirelessly 
driving all over the city two fountain seasons in a row. So first off, thank goodness for modern technology. Google Street View allowed me to virtually drive to all these fountains before I actually literally drove there and determine the direction the sculptures were facing and consider the backgrounds behind the fountains to plan for the best time of day and season to go for a visit for an actual picture. This cut my travel time down to a minimum, but in many cases I still needed multiple trips to the same fountain for a variety of reasons. One of them being seasons. I already mentioned the fountain season, which in the Midwest, not surprisingly, is a very short one. It starts with the official opening of Buckingham Fountain on Memorial Day weekend, and it ends somewhere in October, varying dates. In winter, most fountains are not very attractive to shoot for obvious reasons, but one exception was the Fountain of Time. The dramatic subject is depicted in this massive sculpture, which is people being born on one side and marching toward their demise on the other side while Father Time is watching unaffected, is actually enhanced by the snow cover. Besides, this, water, this fountain doesn't run water in the summer any longer anyway. Of course, the seasons also greatly affect the landscape each fountain lives in, the surrounding vegetation. You can be very lucky, like I was, to happen on a gorgeous display of spring blossoms at, at your backdrop, like here at Gateway Plaza Fountain. You may have to wait for trees to have leaves or for blossoms to open up for the best picture, like with Dove Girl in Grand Park. You might want a color contrast as in this case, uh, another sculpture in Grand Park, I waited for the leaves to turn yellow for the teal to really pop. Another challenge, of course, is the weather. <laughs> it wouldn't be a true Chicago project without the wind interfering. Sometimes I couldn't take photos because the tall fountains spitting up into the air were leaning over in the wind and they made the fountains look quite silly. And it also wouldn't be a fountain project without getting wet. Inevitably, on a few occasions, I got caught in thunderstorms. And while I was taking the pictures for the Aeon Fountain, one of the Aeon Fountains, I accidentally sat down in a puddle to look at my pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, I had to drive home for a change of pants, which meant missing the perfect lighting window for the other shots that I had planned for that day. The biggest challenge probably were people. My goal was to take pictures without people in them to make the fountains really stand out. So I had to take three visits to the 8th Street Fountain because in two separate trips it was occupied by stubborn picnickers who wouldn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> Despite my setting up my tripod and trying to scare them away with this evil German glare. <laughs> How dare they spend their lunch break sitting at a fountain and enjoying the water while I'm trying to take photos. <laughs> At the Board of Trade Fountain, I waited for 40 minutes patiently until the sun was in the perfect uh, position between two high rises. I set up my camera, the sun rays finally started creeping around the corner, and literally the moment I was about to hit my shutter clicker, um, a trainload of Cubs fans piled onto the square. <laughs> And of course, they saw me with the camera and they thought, oh, what a good idea. I need a selfie in front of the fountain. So they started posing one by one for <laughs> selfies. And the sun crept moving, crucially, and I couldn't do anything. Um, thankfully, I managed to snap a picture in time before it was too late. But it's not entirely perfect. You can see a shadow here on the left side. I didn't want that shadow there. <laughs> um, Chase Plaza is usually packed with people especially at lunch, and that is, of course, exactly when the, fountain hit, uh, when the sun hits the fountain from the south. It also doesn't run on weekends when the lunch crowds aren't there, which is something, of course, I learned by driving there in vain on a Sunday. <laughs> so I had to find a time during the week when the sun peeked through behind two buildings for moments in the late afternoon. As you can see, I didn't manage to get a picture entirely without people, but I think they make it actually very romantic. Backdrops. In some cases of these formerly glamorous fountains, the backdrops that are, they are situated in now are just not very attractive looking. For example, the Drake Fountain used to live downtown, and now it's basically turned into a traffic island in a rather bland looking intersection. 
the Independence Square fountain is not only not running, it's also protected by a rather ugly looking fence, so I had to get a little creative. Thankfully, there were nice lilies in front of it to help me with that. Some of the other challenges were fountains that weren't running for a whole season, like spinning water. I kept driving down there from, from Andersonville to Hyde Park to see if it had turned on. Obviously, that's a very long trip, and I was disappointed again and again. I had to wait for the next year. Or they were so badly maintained that in the case of the Nelson Algren Fountain on Ashland and Division, it is lopsided, so the water only comes down on this side. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have a choice of back backdrop here. I had to have these ads in the background. <laughs> um, when I got to the Botanical Gardens Fountain, there were a bunch of green apples floating in the water. Thankfully, somebody noticed that I was trying to take pictures and came and fished them out. Uh, some fountains were under construction for a whole year, like the Eugene Field Memorial in the zoo. I had to come back the next year. And while I took pictures of nature's friends, all of a sudden, big tree branches started falling all around me. They were cutting the trees. <laughs> and you can actually, if you look closely in, in the picture, you can see the cut down limbs in the back, but I managed to make them look okay. <laughs> I also had to deal with uncooperative protagonists, like this horse. <laughs> the horse at the Humane Society fountain was just not thirsty, so we threw a carrot in the water. <laughs> you can't lead a horse to water, but you can make it fish for a carrot. <laughs> My own photographic challenges were mostly about making really every fountain really shine and bring out its individual character. So I played a lot with exposures and shutter speeds to achieve different effects. My favorite challenge was to stop water and really reveal each individual drop or make the water look like glass or like plastic or like a veil. I really like this example because the water is moving in all directions. It's up and down and it's waving and there's individual drops caught mid-air. And of course, I wanted to bring Chicago character and landmarks into each of these, not each of these, but a good portion of these pictures. So in the case of the cover image, I chose almost a frog perspective. I sat down on the floor and I waited for the train to come. Despite all of these challenges, and of course, in some cases because of them, it has been a very rewarding project. I loved getting to know neighborhoods of Chicago that I might otherwise never have visited and learning so much about the city and its curious water spitters. Now I'd like to end my presentation with my personal favorite shot. I know Greg already showed it before, but it is such a magical setting, especially at night, that it's hard to believe that it is just across the street from the Hancock Tower. It looks like a courtyard in the south, south of France. And the lighting was so perfect, it looked like a movie professional had done it for me. So that's the end of my little presentation. Thank you. And if you, if you have questions later, you can come up to me. Great. Next, I have the honor of introducing Deborah Shore, Commissioner of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. Deborah wrote the preface, of course, to uh, the book. But she also provided many ideas and contacts for me to help me in, in my research. Deborah and I first worked together about 20 years ago when she was the founding editor of that glorious magazine, Chicago Wilderness. And, yeah, really. And uh, I was a science writer at the Field Museum trying to get articles placed in that wonderful uh, magazine, and uh, we'll just say Deborah had high standards. <laughs> but we still place many uh, stories with you. Um, then, about 11 years ago, Deborah ran for a commissioner for the first time, and I was proud to go door to door on, on her behalf. It turned out to be a pretty easy task because many people already knew about her work on behalf of water and the environment. Actually having that slogan, uh, when you hear about water, think about shore, uh, that helped too. 
So, so naturally, when I got onto this uh, fountain book, this water book, I thought again about shore. And sure enough, Deborah was uh, very happy to help me uh, get going. So Deborah's been a commissioner now for 10 years, and I'm very, very happy to say, as you all know, that she's running for re-election. Um, so Deborah, actually, I'd be, I'd be happier if she was running for mayor or governor. <laughs> But maybe we all can talk her into that down the road. Deborah Shore. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you all. Thank you, Greg, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm honored and flattered and delighted. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that essential constituent of fountains, water, and then about a fountain that the old sanitary district uh, built uh, some years ago. And I'm gonna begin by quoting from one of my favorite books uh, by an author named Charles Fishman, and the book is called The Big Thirst. And the subtitle is The Secret Life and turbulent future of water. And in it, Fishman writes, one of the hallmarks of the 20th century, at least in the developed world, is that we have gradually been able to stop thinking about water. We use more of it than ever. We rely on it for purposes we not only never see, but can hardly imagine. And we think about it, not at all. It's a striking achievement. We used to build monuments, even temples, to water. The aqueducts of the Roman Empire are marvels of engineering and soaringly elegant design. They were plumbing, presented as civic achievement and as a tribute to the water itself. Today, water has drifted so far from civic celebration that many people visit the Roman aqueducts without any sense at all that they moved water or how. That's the end of my quoting from Fishman, but if you look up the three ingredients essential for life on Earth, the first and foremost is liquid water. And that's why our search for life on other planets and out in space is actually a search for water. Well, what do I need to do? I'll keep going. So water flows through our bodies and through our lives. It's an essential part of some of our most sacred rituals, some of our most universal play. It's a life force and can be massively destructive We relish seeing free-flowing water and mountain streams burbling along and cascading over logs and boulders. Yet fountains are a manifestation of human domination, water constrained, manipulated, funneled to perform. What am I not doing right? Just hit next, okay. that'll do just as good. All right. Um, fountains are water civilized and socialized. Water bent to our will, expressing our creativity and ingenuity. Perhaps not surprisingly, when the nine member board of commissioners of what was then called the Metropolitan Sanitary District, began discussing how to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the agency's founding, which would uh, occur in 1989, they decided to do something with water. Commissioner Joanne Alter proposed a fountain and a water cannon, shooting an arc of Chicago River water across the main stem 
for five minutes at the top of every hour from May to November. Actually, it used to shoot water for 10 minutes each hour, but the tour boat operators and other boaters complained, <laughs> so the length of time was recently shortened. And so the, the cannon draws water from the Chicago River and then propels it out in an arc that nearly reaches the opposite bank. But, and to quote from the book, but the arc is only one part of a glorious water spectacle that the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, and by the way, the agency changed its name as well as part of its centennial from sanitary district to water reclamation district built to commemorate its 100th anniversary. The project includes the lesser known, yet stunning centennial fountain at the base of the water cannon. Cascades of recirculating river water, illuminated by underwater spotlights, flow down the two stepped sides of a granite into a 125 foot wide semicircular basin. This creates something akin to a water amphitheater. Visitors can even walk behind a curtain of falling water and view Chicago's skyline through an aqueous blur. The fountain was designed by Dirk Lohan, who was a friend of Commissioner Joanne Alters and is the grandson of Mies van der Rohe. And describing the centennial fountain along the riverbank, Lohan said, I wanted to symbolize the natural phenomenon of water, how it comes from one source, spreads, and goes to another. And his design was such that the, from the center, which represents Chicago's watershed divide between the Lake Michigan watershed and the Mississippi, that eastern subcontinental divide runs right through Chicago, Water flows in two directions. Six large steps to the west represent the Chicago River, the Sanitary and Ship Canal, the Des Plaines River, the Illinois River, the Mississippi River, and the Gulf of Mexico. Six steps to the east represent Lakes Michigan, Huron, Erie, and Ontario, the St. Lawrence Seaway, and the Atlantic Ocean. And here's my challenge to you. When you visit, can you find the proper name that's misspelled on one of the explanatory panels? <laughs> Commissioning the fountain was a matter of some debate on the board of commissioners at the time, and a number of them balked at the three and a half million dollar price tag. But at the time, Commissioner Alter made an interesting statement in support of the project that I think is worth quoting at length. She said, I think what is happening here is a wonderful example of what's been going on all over the United States. When Jimmy Carter was first elected president, when Jimmy Carter first came into office, he said that the General Service Administration budget that is for public building or public expenditure of funds should have an inclusion for art. That is sculpture, design, painting, tapestries, so that the artistic contribution of the American people would be a part of any public works building or effort. And the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois have this kind of commitment. And today the sanitary district is joining other agencies, I think, in a very important way, committing a part of our public funds to that which is a vital and important part of every human being's existence, and that is the arts and design. It's worth noting, <laughs> right. And so they, they did, they built it, and it's a wonderful part of the river experience uh, near McClurg and the river today. And across the river, where the cannon arc uh, nearly meets is a plaque honoring Joanne Alter. Um, it's worth noting that although the Centennial Fountain was fundamentally a commemorative civic art project, 
for which a water quality component was contemplated, the Water Reclamation District does have a number of other engineered installations whose primary function is water quality, but that happen to have important aesthetic side benefits. They aren't exactly fountains, but they are still interesting, and often they can be remarkably aesthetically pleasing. Some of the most prominent among these are the district's side stream elevated pool aeration stations. We call them SEPA stations. They were constructed to put oxygen into the water in order to provide water quality, improve water quality, to reduce odor and make the water environment better for aquatic life like fish. So they do this by pumping water to an elevation somewhat above the regular river level and then allowing the water to cascade over constructed concrete steps until it gets back down to the level of the stream. In other words, we've reinvented the waterfall. These SEPA stations are fundamentally water quality projects, but they look like waterfalls, and as a matter of fact, area residents often refer to them as waterfalls. And they became gathering places for people to take wedding photos and uh, have family events by them, and often fishermen and Birds fishing are there because of the aerated water attracts fish. And one of the remarkable things about water is this, that when we engineer the built environment for whatever practical purposes we have in mind, if our engineering plans include water, there's often something beautiful and majestic about the finished product. The sanitary and ship canal, the cow sag channel, the North Shore Channel, even though they were built for the most mundane of purposes, namely to use water from Lake Michigan to flush our sewage downstream, they're interesting and attractive, mostly because their central feature is water. Recently, I met a photographer from Skokie named Brad Temkin, who was just named a Guggenheim Fellow for 2017, and the project that he received the fellowship for is called the State of Water. And he's making pictures of water and wastewater infrastructure, including our treatment plants and pumping stations at the Reclamation District. The collaboration displayed in Greg and Yulia's book shows us what can be done when we set our minds to make water beautiful and how water enhances our spiritual lives when a fountain or other water art object is put in our midst. Thank you for this compelling and fabulous work. Thank you to everyone here this evening for your support and interest. And I say, let's dive in. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, Very thoughtful, I appreciate that. All those thoughts, much to think about. Uh, just a few minutes now, I'd like to thank some of the folks who were so helpful to me uh, pulling uh, this book together, so helpful to us pulling this book together. Most of all, I'd like to thank Christine Bertrand, my wife. She's standing there in the back for her support and encouragement, unending. And uh, we're in a library, so I thought I'd just mention a few librarians who who went above and beyond uh, to help me track down stories and images. That would include Leslie Martin with the Chicago History Museum, Neil O'Shea up at the Niles Public Library, and right here at um, Harold Washington Library in the Special Collections uh, Department. Uh, I got a lot of assistance and support from Morag Walsh and Johanna Russ. So that's really appreciated. Uh, I'm also very, very grateful to to Jeffrey Bear, uh, see his picture up here. Um, he, he wrote the foreword, of course, and over the years we've worked together on on several projects. He's uh, very, very uh, sorry he couldn't make it tonight, but he did send me an email 
uh, this morning, and I'd just like to read you his message very quickly. He said, I'm sorry about not being able to attend tonight. I currently am traveling all over the country filming the second season of my new series, 10 Things That Changed America. This season, uh, the uh, three episodes will be 10 monuments, 10 streets, and 10 engineering wonders that changed America. You have to wonder if the uh, Illinois-Michigan Canal will be one of those 10. Um, so Jeffrey continues, today I was working in Boston where we filmed the Bunker Hill Monument and uh, the Robert Gould Shaw Memorial, which broke the color barrier by honoring a pioneering African-American regiment uh, which suffered terrible losses in the famous Battle of Fort Wagner. Uh, maybe next season, he says, we should feature 10 fountains that changed America. Now, there's a good idea. <clears throat> I'm so proud to have played a small part in this monumental undertaking. I hope that after reading it, all of you will be inspired to explore Chicago's many uh, won wonderful fountains. That would be a refreshing way to beat the heat uh, this summer, uh, Jeffrey Bear. Um, I'd also like to thank Southern Illinois University Press, who published the book. Uh, in particular, I'd, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Carl K. Jeff, the acquisition editor uh, for this book, and my guide throughout the process. Is Carl here? Thank you so much for coming. <clears throat> it's been a good ride. <clears throat> uh, time doesn't allow me to mention all the folks who helped. Uh, more than 100 people who contributed in one way or another. Uh, but I just say to all of you, honestly, merci buckets. Uh, of course, there'd be no fountains without your funders, your supportive politicians, your, your builders, your designers, your architects, the crews that maintain the fountains, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I'd just like to mention a couple architects who uh, are very engaged uh, in the success that Chicago has had with fountains. First, there's Ed Winhurst, whom I've dubbed the Chicago Fountain Meister. Uh, Ed, are you here tonight? Uh, he was going to try come. All right, I'm glad you made it. It's been great. You've been so helpful. Uh, Ed's the Fountain Meister because uh, in the late uh, 1990s, Mayor Daley uh, decided to launch a fountain building program. And in a kind of a clunky way, he was going to uh, pop down this very same fountain all over town. And uh, here's what that fountain looks like. All right, it's above ground, so it's easier to maintain. It's very cheap to build, uh, and it's, it's okay, but I don't think we need this 50 times all over town. And so the uh, media got on his case and some community groups said, oh, we don't want that. Before that idea was shut down, four of these were placed around the city, uh, one here on Cortland in, in front of this uh, Finkel Steel plant next to a bus line, next to a rail line. I don't think it ever ran. Uh, another one's in front of the Cook County Jail, uh, 26th and Cal. You know, so that wasn't a good approach but uh, so Daly, to his credit, uh, uh, agreed to start making some custom-made fountains that would be appropriate uh, to the neighborhood. And that's when Ed got involved. He was with uh, Di Stefano and partners at the time. And he must have designed uh, some 15 or 20 of these uh, fountains as part of Daly's fountain program. And uh, some of his masterpieces we've already, we've already seen, uh, Legion Park, um, uh, Printer's Row Fountain, the Joe DiMaggio Fountain. I think I've got those here. Okay, the fountain at uh, Printer's Row. Uh, by the way, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, sloopers, South Loop uh, neighbors and friends here tonight. Um, those uh, local community organizations um, helped to get this built and to get a park in this space. Um, uh, just wonderful addition to the, to the neighborhood. Uh, Ed also did the Joe DiMaggio Fountain, and he also did some, some rebills of, of uh, fountains. Uh, this, is the re this is a replica that he uh, created at the uh, Washington Square Park there in front of Newbury Library. A, a, very, a very good 
uh, accurate replica of a fountain that was there uh, originally in 1906. So thank you for all that work. Uh, another um, fountain-friendly architect is uh, Ernie Wong. Uh, Ernie, are you here tonight? Uh, Hannah Ishikawa, are you here? Uh, they're both with a site design group and they've done some, some beautiful creative work. This is a fountain at Stearns Quarry in Palmisano Park and the design is to replicate a crane which back in the day had been used to uh, quarry here the limestone and then the water drips from the, from the crane-like uh, object and curves around and circulates through the entire park uh, as water does in, in nature in a continuous loop. Another one of Hannah's uh, fountains is this creative piece, the Mist Fountain at Mary Bartlemay Park. And it's especially avant-garde because it's designed specifically to look great in the winter too. You know, why should a fountain look awful in the winter? You shut the water down and all you see is a bunch of pipes and stuff. But this is a centerpiece of the neighborhood uh, for, for the entire year, year in and, and year out. So I thought I'd take the opportunity just to mention a couple of uh, my favorite fountains. Uh, Fountain Heaven is at the base of the Aeon Tower. Uh, we saw a fountain there earlier in the program, but there are six fountains around that area. Um, and it's just delightful how it's so open to the public. Anybody can go there and you can choose a loud fountain or a quiet fountain or an artistic fountain here with the, with the copper rods that make music in the wind. Um, the, uh, another fountain where Julia got wet in her pants <laughs> is this one here, and I love the way aqua in the background uh, repeats the image of water flowing. So that's a great uh, favorite. Uh, we covered this one already. This is what the area looked like before the neighborhood uh, associations got involved in creating a park and a fountain in that spot. And of course, that is now the center of, of uh, Printer's Row Lit Fest every year, which we just had last weekend. Another favorite fountain is this one in Wicker Park, and it is called the Gurgoyle Fountain. And first when I saw that, I thought it's a typo, but no, it features gargoyles that gurgle. So someone had fun naming this one uh, appropriately. Uh, another one we've already seen is the Independence Square Fountain with that awful fence around it. But what makes this kind of fun is it features kids playing with fireworks. They are holding Roman candles and they have uh, cannons and ammunition at their feet. It's wild, but this 4th of July Independence Day kind of uh, mentality attitude uh, of this fountain. Very un-PC for today's standards. Uh, my individual favorite fountain would have to be the one at uh, Giddings Plaza there at Lincoln and Giddings, another Ed Winhurst masterpiece. Um, and when ever since this has been put into that plaza, this plaza has become a magnet for festivals and uh, people just to, to come and sit and read. It's a huge, huge success story. When people say fountains don't matter, they don't make a difference, this proves they're wrong. And don't take my word for it. I'm going to play you um, a beer commercial. And it features this fountain, believe it or not. And so let's jump right into that, and they will explain uh, the story. It's a brewery that wanted to pump beer through a fountain in Portland, and they said no. But Chicago said yes. <laughs> Come on in. And of all the fountains in the city, they chose this Beautiful fountain. All right, let's see if we can make it work. In 1856, Henry Weinhardt wanted to make good beer easy for everyone. So he crafted some really good beer and tried to pump it through a public fountain in Portland. We think that's awesome. So we gave it a shot ourselves.
This is Henry Weinart. Good beer, made easy. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> we're, we're starting to run short on time, so I'm just going to have to skip through a couple things, but we'll, we'll go through the sides, slides quickly. Um, behind most fountains is some kind of incredible or revealing story. And so the book is full of fountain stories. I just want to share a couple. Very briefly, this is the children's fountain put in by Mayor Jane Byrne, uh, 1982, at uh, a traffic island at Wabash and Wacker. Here you see another image of that. Uh, pretty, it's a pretty fountain dedicated to the children of Chicago. She loved it so much, she put it on the cover of her book, and she called it her most important uh, favorite project. There's the fountain in the background. And uh, a work of the heart, and she called it one of the two most, uh, two achievements that meant the most to her in her entire uh, administration. Well, that was like putting a target on her back because Mayor Richard M. Daley came along later and ripped it out. Um, <laughs> And of course it was legitimate because uh, he took it out when Wacker Drive was being rebuilt, but he never got around to putting it back or anywhere. It went lost for five years until finally uh, it was reinstalled in front of the Chicago History Museum. So how, how sad and ironic that a fountain dedicated to children, quote, so they can learn from the past to better the future, uh, was treated like a political pawn. Um, uh, one other quick story in, involves the uh, Fountain of the Great Lakes right by the Art Institute. Uh, it was made by Laredo Taft, uh, one of our greatest sculptors of all time in Chicago. And he had a studio down uh, by the University of Chicago called the Midway Studio where he had students and uh, uh, aspiring artists work and live with him, dormitory style, sharing meals, and here you see Taft presiding. One of those students, Robert Irwin, ooh. <laughs> One of them went on to kill uh, a beautiful young lady, the sister of this woman who he fell in love with, and uh, made a big story all across the, the country uh, finally, they, they, they were almost ready to catch him, and he turned himself in in order to collect the reward money. <laughs> um, and where did he decide to turn himself in? In front of that very fountain, uh, the Fountain of the Great Lakes, because of his a very a close af affinity with Laredo Taft. He turned himself, he made a point to the uh, people he turned himself into that he would uh, meet them in front of Laredo Taft's Fountain of the Great Lakes. More to that story, uh, true crime story in, in, in the book, but let's jump ahead to lost fountains. Uh, many have come and gone. Uh, Buffalo Fountain, an enormous fountain in the middle of a tiny park at Manor, California, um, uh, in Ravenswood Manor. Buffalo Park, it's called to this day. The Olson Rug Company, some of you may have Remembered visiting that, uh, was a stunning waterfall uh, at Diversey and Crawford. Um, some fountains um, were, were not taken out, but they just don't operate anymore. This is on the uh, west side of the Daily News building, uh, still there. They turned it into a, a, a planter, and they use it for advertising things once in a while. A uh, real shame. So I'm asking you here tonight to write to Sam Zell who owns the building, and ask him to restore this beautiful, unique uh, fountain. Some fountains disappear and then reappear. This is the Gateway a Park fountain uh, just outside of Navy Pier, put in in 1995. Uh, there you see it being dismantled only 20 years later, but at least we got a new fountain in the process. That's the new Polk Brothers fountain that replaced that other one. I wish they had rebuilt it in some other part of town, but at least we have a great fountain here in that same space. Peristyle, um, 
put in in, in in 1917, taken out in 1953, used as landfill. Uh, thank goodness it's been replaced as part of the work with Millennial uh, Park. Now I'm going to close with just a, a little bit about fun, the fun of fountains, the fun you can have with fountains, just a, a few things. Chicago, of course, has fun with fountains, has fun fountains, but it could do more. I mean, let's look at just a couple of examples around the world. Uh, talk about creative. This is the floating tap in uh, the island on the island of Menorca. This is uh, the entrance to the Swarovski uh, Museum, Terry, in Innsbruck, Austria. Uh, it's, of course, a jewelry company, and they've replicated the idea of jewelry with the eyes and the water flowing. Uh, Bridge Fountain, all lit up in Seoul, Korea. Uh, in du Dubai, this shoots 50, 50 stories high. And Chicago could do more, and I hope continues to build fountains and appreciate uh, fountains more and more. Here in Swan Fountain in Philadelphia, kids are allowed to play in the fountains. Why not? Here in Cedar Falls, Iowa, the doggies are allowed to play in the fountains. Last day of the fountain uh, operating, the dogs are uh, allowed to play in, in all the fountains uh, around town. Kansas City, Missouri, I mentioned before, is Fountain City, USA. They do tremendous amount of stuff for and with fountains there. Here, for example, there uh, is a special day where artists paint fountains and sell their paintings, and the money is used to maintain and fountains and build new ones. They have bike rides in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, to celebrate their fountains, more fountains there per capita than any city in America. There's Christine, by the way. Uh, in Kansas City, they also dye their fountains, and then they sell the water to generate money for maintenance. And when the Royals won the World Series, the whole town was blue, and they made a ton of money uh, selling the fountain water. Uh, they run fountains in the winter in Kansas City, and as the water heated, shoots up, then it freezes as it falls, and it creates an ice sculpture. So I really hope Chicago can, can embrace some of these ideas. Uh, we do have lovely, uh, fun fountains. I'm not saying we're not doing anything, don't have anything in that regard, but we should do more. A great fun fountain is, is uh, man and fish, man with fish in front of the aquarium. There's smaller, lesser known ones like the bathtub fountain at the Salvage One. Uh, a very popular site for weddings and parties. People like to get their pictures taken in front of this. And this I happened to catch on video, and I just want to share it with you. Talk about having fun with fountains. Let's use our fountains for more and different things. Let's watch this video. That's the Chase Fountain, Exelon Plaza. Oh, what do you suppose they're up to? Exactly, the ice bucket challenge. So here they go. Remember when this was popular? <clears throat> yeah. That must have been even more fun than knowing that it was fountain water. Okay, so the, of course the most fun fountain in the whole country is our very own Crown Fountain. Uh, I tell you, this is just uh, incredible on a hot summer day. So I'm going to leave you with this image. Go forth and have fun with fountains. this up now. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to open it up to uh, questions. If you have a question, please either come to the mic or speak up so that I can repeat the question. We have time for a few questions. If anybody wants to know more about the uh, photography or water or... Yes. Uh, the question is, why does the Fountain of the Great Lakes not have water? I called the uh, Park District today about that, uh, yesterday, and they say, well, it's not our problem, it's the Art Institute. 
and the Art Institute doesn't return a call. So a lot of fountains don't have a strong patron, um, and they're just not a priority. They cost money to uh, keep working. But the sad part of that is it didn't run for a second last year either, the entire year. So we got these fountains. Let's, let's make them work. Let's appreciate them. Questions? Yes, please. Uh, yes, um, we are all water wealthy. Um, and so it makes it difficult to talk about water conservation, being water wealthy, and living uh, right up the street from 20% uh, of the planet's fresh water supply in Lake Michigan. So we know that there is a shortage of water on the planet, and how will that affect um, fountains going forth? And this is something that we may not have to think about so much here in the Great Lakes region because we are so water wealthy with all that fresh water right there. So that, that's, that's sort of my question. I'm just, I, I just have a real concern because I know of the scarcity and the issues surrounding water and humanity is kind of projecting its issues into and onto the water. Water privatization is a problem in all, yeah. in becoming in, in Africa and other third world countries. So, so that's the basis of my question is uh, with climate change, yeah. global warming. So Deborah, could you please take a swing at that one? That is a very excellent and tough question. So it is a fact that the Great Lakes hold nearly 20% of the world's fresh surface water. Water is a global resource, but it is a local resource. And I think it is certainly incumbent on us, who are fortunate enough to have access to Great Lakes water, to demonstrate good stewardship and not be wasteful. And our challenge, as you note, is to learn to live like misers in a world of apparent plenty. But conserving water here won't help those in California or other places where water is scarce. Eventually, depending on what happens with climate change, I believe we may see an internal migration from the drought-stricken areas or if the sea levels rise from the coasts to the Great Lakes cities because of our access to fresh water. I think we'll see it happening with industry before we see it happening with individuals. People will do everything they can to find and get more water where they are before they move. But we may see significant displacement because of that. And we have an opportunity because of our access to fresh water, because it is a strategic asset and an economic asset, to help grow a robust economy. And that the cities of the Rust Belt will be the cities of the Water Belt. Um, there is a great deal we can do to reduce our own water footprint and our water budget. Um, but some of the drivers for that that have occurred in California and Texas for reuse of water, rainwater and, and used water to flush toilets, for instance, we're behind in doing some of that here. But we can do it. And I tell young people, if you want to do something where there are going to be jobs, do something with water. Great. Another question? Um, all right, up at the mic, and then John, you're next. I think that's John. Um, what is the oldest fountain in the United States? Oh, boy. <laughs> you got me. Um, Yulia, can you handle that question? No. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm guessing it's something in Boston or Philadelphia or New York. Deborah? Nah. I, I didn't do that once I decided to focus on Chicago. I just didn't do that much research uh, around the rest of the country. But I'm going to look it up. Thank you. Uh, John, you had a question? Go, go ahead. Hi, this question is for Yulia. Um, your photography is beautiful and very inspirational, so thank you. Um, my question is, what is your personal favorite fountain and why? Uh, thank you, May. I think you've stumped me there. <laughs> um, but, well, I did show 
one of my favorite settings was the, the Garth Fountain. I really like the fountain, and I know Greg and I disagree on this, um, the spin, spinning water oh, fountain in really? Hyde Park. <laughs> it's misnamed because it doesn't actually spin. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it looks like, like a it, could, it should be spinning. Yeah. Um, but that's probably one of my favorites, spinning water. Very cool. Um, there have been some, uh, for example, Old City Hall. The, qu the question is, were there any major fountains that were planned but never built? And uh, there are several. Uh, Klaus Oldenburg, who made the baseball bat in front of the Social Security building, for example, proposed an enormous uh, windshield wiper and it would have been a blade that went back and forth, back and forth, into two pools of water, one on each side. And as it dipped in the pool, it would fill with water. As it came up, it would drip out. And then it would flop over to the other pool, pick up more water, back and forth, back and forth. This was planned for Columbus Avenue uh, near Jackson and Monroe, somewhere in that area, with an arm about a block long. Uh, you know, so uh, it's, I'm not certain that it ever would have worked, but it was taken seriously, and he ended up doing the bat column instead of that proposed uh, fountain. There was a question down here. Yes. What do they do with the pennies? Oh, nobody knows. <laughs> nobody, oh. Will, nobody will fess up to that. Uh, the question is, what happens to the pennies or better money that gets thrown into fountains? The uh, park district says they clean out those coins from their fountains, but it never amounts to much. And I believe it. I've looked at so many fountains in the last uh, several years around town, and there's hardly any change. This is not Trevi Fountain. <laughs> where they get a you know a thousand bucks a day in Rome, um, and so I think Chicagoans are just too sensible to throw away uh, their money, and it's 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 no big deal. They just scoop it up. Uh, homeless people, I'm sure, grab a few coins once in a while, but there isn't much to be had. Thank you. Yes. The question is, are there other fountains on the great boulevards similar to the Drexel Fountain? None comes close to the beauty and majesty of that 1883 fountain of, of Francis Drexel. But there are other uh, fountains on the boulevards. At the other end of Drexel Boulevard is another uh, fountain. And then there's uh, one at... Uh, on the west side, uh, I'm not sure if it's Independence and, and, and uh, Garfield where they meet, but there are a couple of fountains, especially where the boulevards meet. Uh, but there is a, a dearth of, of fountains in certain parts of town, the south side and the west side. And uh, I try to explore all of them as much as possible and find them and, and honor them, but there aren't very many. We need more. Yes. Money. <laughs> he was uh, running the Drexel. The, I'll repeat the question. If Drexel never set foot in Chicago, how did he get a street and a fountain named after him? He did because he was very rich. He owned property through his bank, and he donated property to the city on the condition that a street through the middle of it be named Drexel. And it took a long time for that to happen. When it finally happened, um, the, uh, the sons built a fountain in gratitude for, for the city uh, giving that uh, street the Drexel name. One more question. I think we're running really short on time. Hey, Greg. Yes, um, hi. What are some of your favorite 
fun fountains that are out there. Um, obviously, you know, Millennium Park with that mm -hmm. uh, Prisker Fountain is really great, but uh, any other smaller fountains? I mean, I like the fountain over at Navy Pier yes. where it jumps, the water jumps. Uh, same thing they've got in the entrance to the part of uh, McCormick Place, the uh, East Building or the mm -hmm. West Building. So uh, give me a sense of some of your favorite fun fountains. Fun that, fountains. Uh, uh, do you have any idea from your shooting? Fun fountains. I can think of one while you're well, thinking. I didn't shoot this one because we agreed not to shoot indoor fountains. But um, when I first moved to Chicago 13 years ago, I really liked the one at the, um, the Water Tower Mall. That yes. just the little little the bloops that packets jump of up water. On, on the escalator. <laughs> yeah, that's tremendous fun. There's a fun fountain at the 63rd Street Beach House, which has been beautifully restored. And the fountain is all kinds of interactivity However, it is often locked up and not open to the public. Sometimes there's private events, and often it's just completely shut down. It rarely operates, uh, unfortunately. So, um, I, I Googled an answer for the young lady's question, the oldest fountain in America. Oh, great. It's in front of City Hall in New York. In front of City Hall in? 1842. Oldest fountain in the United States, 18... 42 in front of City Hall in New York City. Thank you for that. Thank you.